Back to the Clydesdale Fitness and Friends. This is part three of our coaches series uh, leading up to the games. It's the Clydesdale Fitness and Friends. I'm your host. We love to do fitness. This is my friend Kiefer. Um, Kiefer, you are the assistant head coach at Underdogs. Yes, sir. And how are you today? I'm doing well. Monday is a little bit of an off day for us. So I get to recharge and get ready for another week as we're just about two weeks out now from the games. So what does that schedule look like for the next two weeks? You know, at this point, uh, I think most coaches would agree, like you're not necessarily trying to get that much fitter at this point. It's much more about tying up loose ends, practicing things that you might not have to practice at other points in the year whether it's, you know, certain event setup or spending a little bit more time outside of the box on things that, again, like you don't see at the open quarters, semifinals level, we really only see when we get to the game. So, you know, refining things, touching up on stuff, um, you know, as clues start to come out, if they come out, playing around with some things that we might think we might see and, you know, just trying to build confidence for our athletes is the most important thing. How difficult is it this year knowing that we have a different programmer for the first time in the history of the games? Uh, you know, I don't think that we put a ton of thought into how it might be different. I think that, you know, Boz has talked about this a little bit on podcast too, but, you know, there's a certain amount of history and tradition that he wants to uphold and that we kind of expect to be upheld. And at the end of the day, like, if we're doing our job throughout the year, our athletes should be fit enough to handle pretty much anything that's that's sent their way. And if there's something that's drastically outside of our expectations, then that's the same for every athlete across the board. And it really just comes down to like who can adapt on the fly, who can come up with a good game plan for that. And, you know, that's stuff that's out of our control. So I want to go back in time a little bit. I want to get a little bit of an origin story of you so that our <laughs> listeners know who you are, where you came from. And I will say like, you don't have a big footprint on the internet when I went researching and that's maybe that is, that is on purpose. I don't know. But the first thing I want to talk about is you played basketball as a youth. Yep. Yeah, I played played basketball growing up, uh, and I walked on and played basketball for two years in college as well. Yeah, and not just any college, like UConn. Y yeah. Yeah, a perennial top 10 team in the country. Yeah, uh, you know, I didn't go to UConn with the intention of playing basketball, but um, I guess, uh, you know, I had enough enough talent. I worked hard enough to to earn a spot and spent a couple of years doing that. And it was a pretty unique experience. So I want to talk about what that gives you as a coach. You're a walk on. Mm -hmm. Nothing's are nothing's given. You have to earn every bit of getting on that team. How does that help you be a coach later in life? Uh, <clears throat> you know, I think it helps from a perspective of knowing that there really is a balance between like people excelling at a high level because they're talented and because they're predisposed to that and people excelling at a high level because they're willing to put in the work that nobody else is. And it's not totally skewed one direction or the other, because there are examples of athletes on either end of that spectrum. Like, you know, I would consider Carrie Pierce to be an athlete that wasn't necessarily the most talented, but she was willing to work harder than everybody else. And you know, she was arguably the fittest American woman for, for multiple years in a row. Um, but, you know, on top of kind of that work ethic perspective, I think it was a really cool opportunity to spend a lot of time around elite athletes in a more traditional sport, you know, uh, not just the guys that I played with, some of which went on to play pro ball, but the guys that would come back and play with us in the off season. So, you know, I remember some of the most fun times we had were, were, you know, weeks when guys like Ray Allen and Rudy Gay would come back and come to practice and play. And so having an opportunity to interact with professionals in a sport and seeing the way they carry themselves, but also building the confidence that, you know, I don't have to be as good as them to be able to relate to them or to be able to talk to them and have a conversation about what we're doing is something that I can now carry with me into another sport where, you know, I'm not as talented as the athletes that I work with, but I know how to relate to somebody that's going through something on such a high level. And I think that's part of where I'm able to excel as a coach, you know, under Justin's wing with this crew. Did you play under Jim Calhoun? Yeah, I played for one year with Jim Calhoun, one year with Kevin Ollie. Jim Calhoun is considered to be one of the greatest coaches to ever do it in college basketball. Mm -hmm. Did you learn anything from him to, that you're bringing forward as a coach? 
<clears throat> you know, uh, to be totally honest, uh, my relationship with Coach Calhoun is probably different than the relationship that a lot of the scholarship athletes would have had. Um, from everything that I know from the guys that I was close with on the team, he was like a second father figure to them. Um, he was super close. He had a lot of like one-on-one -on -one conversations with everybody. And through that, he was able to ask of and expect a, a high level of excellence and work ethic from every one of those guys every day. And it was something that could go unspoken and that you just knew that that's what was expected of you. Um, and that's what you could be rewarded for or loved for in return. Uh, as a walk-on, I didn't have that same interaction with him. You know, when I was there, it was the very end of his career and not that he treated us poorly, but he was very much focused on the guys that were going to be on the floor with him. And my interactions were much more with some of our assistant coaches. And so I know what that relationship was like, but I didn't necessarily experience it firsthand myself. So what happened when Kevin Ollie came the next year? Did, did that, did that relationship change for you? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> One of the first things Coach Ali did when, when he came in the next year is he said, I don't care uh, what year you are. I don't care what your experience was last year. I don't care if you're a scholarship player or a walk-on. Everybody's going to be treated the same and everybody's going to earn their spot on this team. And so it was very much like a, a way for him to wipe the slate clean and say, like, nothing is given to you. You're going to prove this to me. And it was a whole different set of challenges. It was definitely a more nerve-wracking year, but a rewarding year in the same way because, you know, in my first season with them, I could go to practice knowing that like, you know, whether I give hundred percent or I give 80%, I'm still just the walk on. I'm still the scout team guy. I'm going to play defense when they're running their offenses, or I'm going to play, you know, Syracuse run Syracuse's offense so they can practice defense against it. When coach Ollie came in, it was like, okay, like there's this carrot at the end of the stick of like, I'm trying to earn a spot right now. And so it's it totally turns things up a notch in terms of how hard or how competitive I am in practice, knowing that like, you know, maybe there's an opportunity that I'm actually going to see the court when it's not a scenario where we're beating a team by 30 points. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that there's a mindset to being a walk on because one, you're just trying to make the team that that's like the first goal. And there's no, there's no guarantee that if you even make the team that you're going to see the floor. Yeah. So it, it's all this incremental thing. And I think that it's, it's kind of cool because CrossFit's kind of that way, right? There's no guarantee when you walk in that gym that you're going to get a muscle up. Right. But maybe you get a pull up mm -hmm. and then maybe you get a chest to bar. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's so can you translate that into being a coach in CrossFit? I can translate that, I think, in terms of finding an appreciation for the process and knowing that there are times when you can't control your outcomes. Like I can't control if I'm going to see the floor. I can't control if. I'm going to be one of the walk-ons that gets chosen to get a jersey for the night and actually suit up for the game. Just the same as like our athletes can't control what workouts are going to be put out, what quarterfinals are going to look like, what somebody else's score is on a workout. But what you can control is the way that you show up every day and put in the work and know that you're maximizing what you're capable of so that at the end of the day, you can be proud of your efforts and you know, the chips are going to fall how they are and you can use that as motivation and fuel, but like you can only control yourself. So then you, you graduate from UConn with an exercise science degree. Mm -hmm. You go into strength and conditioning. And yep. I think you actually started that at UConn. Yep. And you did some digging. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I tried to do my research. I was, you know, kind of my loophole that I was fortunate enough was um, I did an internship in college through the strength coach that worked with our basketball team. And I interned under him working with our soccer teams predominantly and a little bit with my own team, but that's obviously like a slight conflict in, in certain ways. Um, and then through that, I ended up with a, a, another internship right out of college, working at a facility that worked primarily with college and pro level baseball players. And that was kind of my trajectory for a little while was, you know, traditional sport athletes, high school, college, professional level, a lot of baseball, a little bit of some other sports. Um, and I did that for probably you know, three to five years. Um, and towards the tail end of that is when I started getting into Olympic lifting and then I got into gymnastics. And then, you know, I was just talking to somebody about this the other day, but I was like that traditional strength coach who wasn't supposed to be into CrossFit because in the strength and conditioning world, you're supposed to think that CrossFit is stupid and they don't plan things out and everything. But I was like secretly watching the documentaries and I had been to the CrossFit games to watch before I had ever started doing CrossFit. And so 
I like slowly trickled over into the world before I actually made a full splash in it. And what was, what was the event that made you jump into CrossFit? Uh, you know, it wasn't for a lack of resistance. I, I had, I had taken a job opportunity in Philadelphia. Uh, I thought it was going to be awesome. It was still in the strength and conditioning world. It was at a facility that, you know, if I was to best describe it simply, it's almost like if a CrossFit gym was based around powerlifting. And so it was the same kind of community type feel, just the programming was different and their vibe was all like powerlifting based. Um, anyway, that didn't work out, didn't go well. I moved back to Boston at that time. And the girl I was dating was a coach part-time at Invictus Boston. Uh, and she was a CrossFit athlete. And so I just started like dropping in with her as I was trying to figure out what my next steps were. So I showed up to the gym, you know, I met some people. That's when I met um, Tola and Kelsey Keel. And I became, you know, fairly close with the owner of the gym. And eventually he offered me a, a job there uh, initially just to coach weightlifting, but through, you know, COVID related circumstances, the gym closing down and then reopening, I ended up coaching CrossFit classes for them. And then, you know, slowly progressed from there. And eventually you um, became the director of programming. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, I suppose that's, that's, you know, one of the jokes is that no matter where I go and what I do for work, in the fitness space, like somehow my title always ends up being director of programming. I suppose I'm better with uh, the numbers and the programs than I am with the people. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Um, so then, what what was it that took you to Vegas? Uh, you know, so obviously, like I said, I met I met Tola when I was at Invictus in Boston, uh, and he and I became really close friends. Um, the owner of Invictus, his name is Josh Plosker, one of the owners. He is also a close family friend of Justin Kotler and Ashley. And so between the two of them, uh, I had became, I became connected with the Kotlers a little bit. When Tola moved to Vegas, I went out with him a couple of times to visit. Uh, I met the Kotlers and ultimately like our relationship started because I asked Justin the right questions at the right time. Um, we went out there and this is, I think is it 2020 now, maybe right around oh, 2021, I guess it's last year. Wow. Um, last year, right before quarterfinals, and I just started asking him questions. I said, you know, I, I honestly asked him, I think my first question was, uh, if you don't mind me asking you, like, how do you make a living in the sport? Because, like, I'm no stranger to remote programming and coaching, and I know that there's not a ton of money in it. And I also know that the higher level of athletes that you work with, the less athletes you can really handle at a time. And so I just wanted to know, like, how he was making ends meet with it. You know, he was working with Carrie Pierce at the time and Bethany and a few other athletes and he was having success with that or they were having success, but it's just not like a lucrative endeavor. And so I asked about that. And my follow up was, you know, why don't you have a business or a brand that supports you and what you're doing? Um, you know, cause he owned, they owned up until very recently a gym in Queens. Um, but you know, when you look at things like Ben Bergeron and comp train, or you look at CJ and Invictus, um, and proven and all of these other camps, like, you know, there is a business and a virtual programming entity that helps support what the coaches are doing so that they can, you know, afford to spend their time and efforts on the high level athletes that they're helping reach their goals. And Justin didn't have that yet. <laughs> and I think that it just kind of got his wheels turning. And, you know, I left right after quarterfinals that year. And about a week later, I got a text from him asking if I was willing to get on a phone call. And the phone call was, you know, I want to start this. Do you want to help? And, and that's, you know, 16 months ago now when we started underdogs. Wow. <laughs> and now you're the assistant head coach. I am. I was, I, you know, I worked remotely with the company until right before quarterfinals this year. And uh, I'm super fortunate that, you know, the people that I work for in Invictus Boston have always been really supportive of what I do. Uh, and I told them I wanted to come out here for the season and trial run it. And they were totally on board. And so, you know, I packed my car, I moved out to Vegas right before quarters and I've been there since. And I just actually signed a new lease to stay here for another year. Wow. Mm -hmm. Really cool. So I got to see you and Justin at three of the North American semis. Yep. And I, I think I promoted this as you are the yin to Justin's yang. Very much so. I and, think. And if people watch the two of you together, you are very different in demeanor. 
you may have the, the same thought processes, the same strategies, things like that, but you are very calm. Justin is very animated. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that what makes you guys a good team? Uh, yeah, I, honestly, I think so in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I owe so much to Justin in terms of what he's taught me in the last year, as well as the liberties that he's given me to be myself and to learn things and to, and to bring ideas to the table for what we do with underdogs. Um, but as far as the way we interact, like with the team, the way we interact when we go to competitions and stuff, um, his energy and his presence allows me to be comfortable with how mine is, if that makes any sense. You know, I'm a little bit more introverted, especially in like large groups, big spaces. Uh, sometimes I get anxious, but sometimes also it's just my first instinct is to process and to think through things, whereas his is to, uh, you know, make facial expressions and get super animated and yell to what's going on on the field and, and shake hands and kiss babies and all of that stuff. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like, you know, I know that certain people respond better to the, like the energy piece of things. And I know for me personally, like that's a challenge at times. And so, you know, the two of us working together allows him to be himself and allows me to be myself. And, and, uh, you know, we have different perspectives on things. And I think that's a big part of what makes things work. I don't know if you can see the comment below. Oh uh, yeah. Does Kiefer, Kiefer paint his nails and get piercings with the, the athletes too? So the funny thing about this is that the nail painting was initially my idea with the girls and not Justin's and he doesn't give enough credit for that. So before Mac, um, we knew we were going to be down in Tennessee for like a week prior hanging out because, you know, we had been there for syndicate, the girls were getting there early so that they could prep. Uh, and one of the things we had, I had jokingly talked about with them was that I had never gotten a pedicure and I was like, this is, this is the week. Like I'll go with you guys. We'll get our nails painted. And I told them, I was like, all right, I'll paint, you know, one set of nails for one of you, one set for the other. And so while we were down there, Justin decided to come as well, as did Justin to uh, who was doing a lot of, um, you know, media work for us. And so we go and I'm getting my nails done. And I noticed that Justin's getting his fingernails done. And so the end of all of like the end of the couple of days happens, obviously my feet are in shoes, his fingers are out in the open. And all of a sudden he's getting all the publicity for his fingernails being painted. And, uh, you know, some of us just sit back knowing that we didn't do it, you know, for the media attention. We just did it truly to support the people we were there for. <laughs> nice. Very nice. So I, I want to step back to moving to Vegas. Sure. I, I have visited the Cutlers in Vegas. I have friends that have visited the Cutlers in Vegas. How much did Ashley recruit you? once you connected with them to come to Vegas? Uh, gosh, I don't know that a week went by where she didn't try to recruit me to come to Vegas. Uh, it's like she has a reminder on her phone and every week it's like a reminder pops up, she shoots a text. She's like, hey, what do you think about moving here? Or you know, she could tell the weather is <laughs> shitty in Boston because it's the middle of the winter and she'll send us a screenshot of the weather there. Or you know, there were times where like she would meet a girl that she thought was, you know, around my age and that I might be interested in. And she'd say, Hey, I, I found a girl for you. It was relentless approach in every way possible. Um, but that's, what's great is like, you know, it, <laughs> it can be a lot, but they like truly love and want us around here, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I can't say enough good things about them. Um, I joke with Ashley, like every time, like she, that she needs an assistant, I'm very qualified. Um, I love the warm weather <laughs> and she's like, get your butt out here. We're always looking to add to the team. Um, so yeah, so there's that. The other thing I want to talk to you about while we're kind of in this mode is, uh, you love your Starbucks, yeah, but they don't seem to love you. No. Uh, you know, it, I don't even know how it started, but it just became a thing for a while. It's, it's not unique to me, but Starbucks obviously doesn't put a lot of time and effort into trying to spell people's names correctly. And I'm sure that to some degree it's intentional because it gets, it gets attention on it like it does with my social media. But it just became a, like a trend for a while of me showing how far off they could possibly get with the way that they spell my names to the point where I would have friends that would go to Starbucks, order with my name just to see what they would get with it as well. So I went through, you have it saved yeah. as a 
storyboard in Instagram. I went through them. I was laughing my ass off. <laughs> yeah. When though, like Heathrow got me completely. <laughs> so you are now an airport. Yep. Um, Kyle, how you get Kyle from Kiefer? Not a clue. It and then it, the spelling of Kiefer. Yeah, it's it started at a point it made me feel bad about myself because it's like, all right, you know, there are times where I'm not the uh, loudest or clearest speaker. I'm like, do I just mumble? Is this all on me? Like, are these people truly like not hearing me or unsure, or do I need to work on the way that I say my own name? The best spelling was K E Y F U R. Yep, that's perfect. Kefir. It's phonetically correct, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So do you still, you still go to Starbucks every day? I don't, I don't go to Starbucks much one because I've uh, smartened up and I make more of my coffee at home, but also Starbucks just isn't the, what's closest to me around here in Vegas. So I've given them a little bit of a break. Yeah. My wife doesn't let me buy coffee. She's like, that's just too big of an expense. We can make it so much cheaper at home. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. not, the same, um, but, you know, there's something special about that green straw. Uh, I don't know. We can make <laughs> some pretty good coffee here. I'll have to come over sometime. Uh, to make me some. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm no Matt Fraser. I'll tell you that. Like I don't have the bougie machines and all that stuff, but, um, but yeah, we always, we splurge on the good beans, all of yeah. that stuff. So how hard was it for you to switch from athlete to coach or were you always kind of that had that coach mindset, even when you were playing? I, you know, it's been hard in some ways, especially in the last year or two, because I'm such a competitive person and I've always identified so much as being an athlete. Not that I am not also a coach and that I've not coached for the last 10 years, but more that like, I finally reached a tipping point where there's just not enough time and energy and attention to put into both. And I've had to be okay with taking a step back in the athlete department to be that coach. Um, and so I think it's less about turning up, being it like having a hard time turning on a coach brain. And it's more about having a hard time turning off the athlete brain where like you want to compete, you want to prove yourself. And you, I ultimately just like, you know, the last couple of years get to the point of saying like, nobody gives a shit how good I am as an athlete. Uh, what they care about is that, you know, I can communicate with them, that I can support them and, and that I can give them the things that they need to be successful. And like, you know, whether or not I'm still a good athlete by their standards isn't as important. And so I think that that's like an evolution of a coach as you become more confident in your skill set and potentially your intelligence that you don't feel the need to have your athleticism prove itself to prove that you're a good coach, if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know if you can see the comment, but... And there's, there's a I, I, other tough spelling of Kiefer. Yeah. Yeah. There's an extra F in there, isn't there? Yeah. I can't, maybe he's doing it on purpose. I don't know. PC should know better. <laughs> yeah. So noble, you're a noble model. I didn't see that in my research. That's probably intentionally. It's not really something that I'd ever advertised. Uh, I, <laughs> so noble's obviously local to the Boston area. Um, I got connected with them a year, year and a half ago through Tola, as well as another friend that did some modeling with them, um, just because they were looking for more men's men for their menswear stuff. So, uh, I did a few shoots for them. I'm obviously not local to Boston, so not currently doing so, but I have good relationships with that team and they were amazing to work with and I still wear their stuff every day. So, yeah. um, then are you still a nutrition coach with black iron? Yeah. So technically, yes, but I don't do a lot of nutrition coaching for them. My role is primarily on the training side. Um, so Black Iron, you know, started with the nutrition coaching, but they spun off a training business and we deliver training programs much more for like the general population. So while we do have programs for weightlifting, for powerlifting, one that's more of a CrossFit style program, I would not consider them to be like elite competitor type programs. Um, a lot more of our programs are like you know, basic strength conditioning programs and dumbbell only based strength programs and more of like a, uh, like a global gym style program. So finding programs that fit the clientele that we work with primarily with black iron nutrition, which is, you know, the, the 99% of the world, 
Um, and that's been something that's been, you know, awesome for me. It's a, it's an amazing team working for Chrissy has been great. It's also something I can do hundred percent remotely. So it allows me to really balance my time between what I'm doing in person with our elite CrossFit crew. And then what I do as far as writing training programs more for like a general population. Is that kind of the formula to being successful as a coach and supporting yourself is taking on multiple types of jobs? Yeah. Taking on saying yes to everything until ultimately you blow up or something works. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's been the formula for me. I don't know that it is in every case a sustainable formula. Honestly, I think that, you know, I've said this a million times. I'm incredibly fortunate that I work for the people that I do at each of these companies that are both secure in themselves and what they do for a business. And they're trusting in me that they allow me to, to kind of operate in these three different spheres without being upset about where my attention is going or being threatened by what I'm doing somewhere else. Um, you know, I, I still write the affiliate programming for Invictus Boston. I work with Black Iron and then I work with Underdogs Athletics. And in my mind, those three entities are like very separate in terms of the population they're trying to serve. Um, but I could see how for, for other people, it could be really challenging for them to decipher like what's going on. Is this a conflict of interest? Um, but, you know, in doing so, they've made it possible for me to, uh, you know, comfortably live and have the lifestyle that I do and do the work that I do. And uh, I'm super grateful for it. With all those jobs, you have to have some balance in your day. How do you get your own fitness and train to stay to stay fit? Uh, I, I, honestly, I've struggled a little bit this year. Um, and I've realized that my fitness in a lot of ways is a product of like having the right community of people around me to work out with. When I was in Boston, I had an awesome crew of the other coaches that I worked out with. Um, you know, we had like our staff workout time. So I knew that no matter like what I was doing in the morning, or what I was doing in the evening, that was my dedicated time for that. Uh, in Vegas, I still have that time. I know that it's available to me, but it's primarily solo. This is the first time I've come to a place. And this kind of goes back to our talk about like being a coach versus an athlete where everybody that I'm here for is one of the athletes I'm coaching. And so I don't train while they train because that's my time to coach them. And so I end up spending a lot more time working out alone which has been a transition for me and something that I struggled a little bit more with, but, uh, there is no question that getting in my, you know, one to two hours of fitness a day is like crucial for my sanity in between all the other stuff I'm doing. Yeah. So I want to, I want to talk about kind of what happened last week, but I don't want to talk about it. So it's already been statements have already been released. Things have been said. It's already done. How has that impacted the two athletes that you are trying to get ready for the games? Uh, not at all. Um, okay. You know, I th the two athletes that were getting prepared for the games both have such a great attitude towards training and what they're doing. Um, and such a great, you know, even though it's new, such a great relationship with each other where, you know, obviously we have, you know, Ricky Grard who's a male athlete. Alex Kazan, who's a female athlete, they're not competing directly against each other. So in that sense, it makes it even a little bit easier because they can go head to head in training and they can support each other and give each other, you know, tips on different things they're doing without feeling like they're helping a competitor. But they're also just the type of person, the type of athlete that we love to have in our camp. And that, you know, while they know that this is a solo endeavor, they're also very much about the team, whether that's, you know, the times of day that they choose to do their sessions and making sure they're communicating well with each other or the way that they push each other through the end of workouts. Um, they are very different athletes. Ricky is incredible at the outside of the box stuff. He's incredible at like the grind. Alex is incredibly skilled and talented, but some of the outside of the box stuff is newer for her. And so they, they kind of ding and dong and they bounce off each other really well in that they know that they can push each other in different areas. Um, and it's just been a lot of fun, you know, obviously, Allie just competed at Can West, so she was gone. Um, but prior to that, we had, you know, people like Allie and Mitch McClune and even Carrie Pierce coming back in and Kyra jumping in and doing anything that they can to help support these guys as they're getting ready for the games, whether that's, you know, pushing them in a workout that they know is in their wheelhouse or giving them tips on things that they've done in the past, especially with somebody like Carrie who has so much games experience. Um, you know, you know, underdogs went through what it went through in the, la the last week or two, but it's really been like, head down, eyes forward, focus on the goal, and everybody's been able to train. And I think we're in a really good position to succeed this season. 
So I think when I was talking to Justin a little bit ago, probably months ago, he said that Carrie wanted to help from a mindset perspective. Um, and that meant like less time in the gym, but now as we're approaching games, is she showing up more to be kind of the rabbit kind of, and doing the mindset stuff with the, with the athletes? Yeah. Um, Carrie has showed up for at least half of the training sessions each week for the last couple of weeks and will probably for the next couple, you know, she definitely comes in for the whole weekend session. She pops in during the week when she can, when she's not busy with work. Um, and so she has been one, just a positive presence in the gym because anybody who knows Carrie knows that that's just the personality that she brings to things, but she's also been such a good push for the two of them. And also both before and after workouts, a great brief on, you know, here's what you're going to expect in a workout like this when you're at the games. Here's how you're going to, here's what you should expect in terms of preparation for this. Like, here's how corrals will go. This is how they're going to set things up. And so, you know, as we go through some of these, you know, mock game style workouts or mock game style days that are drawn out, um, it's just, you know, that veteran experience is invaluable to the two of them. And you said that Carrie Pierce's boyfriend is coming too. Carrie Pierce's boyfriend, uh, also known as Mitch, is uh, he's he's in the gym and he trains with us regularly as well. Yeah, you know he's a part of our everyday training crew. Um, he also has a full time job, so he's he's out a little bit during the week, but he's there with us on the weekends. And so, you know, them as well as um, Rafter and Ali, Matt. You know, we have a really good crew in house, and everybody's kind of there to support each other right now. And for the listeners that may not know, we actually had Mitch on the show. And he said that that's all he's known as in the gym is Carrie Pierce's boyfriend. And they even had a shirt made, I think, where on the back it said Carrie Pierce's boyfriend. We did, you know, and he had this whole plan for how he was going to wear it at semifinals. And he was going to try and plan it out to wear it for, you know, the event that he thought he would have the best finish in so he could get more camera time. And he, he super messed up not doing it on that complex because the way that he pointed and screamed into the camera, if he had the shirt on, that would have been all he needed to have people actually know his name outside of you know, being Carrie's boyfriend. <laughs> and he's such a great guy too. Like such a great guy. Um, and, and he has his strengths too. So yeah. is that, is that kind of what happens is like, Allie's good at this or Mitch is good at that. And so you kind of, you're the rabbit in that case for these two. Uh, not necessarily. I just, you know, I think that everybody is willing to be the rabbit when they're, when they're there and they're not prepping for something else specific that requires them to do a different sort of training, right? Whether that's a wheelhouse workout for them or a workout where they also know they're going to benefit from the push that they're going to get from one of our, our games athletes. It's just a collective effort. And obviously like, you know, we know that there are certain workouts that Ali's going to give a better push on maybe than Mitch would, for example, on something, but that doesn't mean that we're like specifically saying like, no, 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 not you, Mitch, Ali, you come here for this workout. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That would be a little weird, I guess. Yeah. Now that you say it out loud. <laughs> um, so PC's asking uh, is what's your favorite tattoo and how's the leg sleeve going? Oh gosh. Favorite tattoo. Um, uh, you know, uh, I have a tattoo of my little brother's handprint on my back shoulder that I've had since I was maybe 19. Um, and for its own special reasons, that's probably my most important one. Okay. Uh, leg sleeve. Leg sleeve is going well. Uh, I'm at a rate of like one to two pieces every couple of weeks. So uh, hopefully by sometime this fall, it should be done. But it's a lot of real estate to cover. Yeah, I did a half sleeve and I didn't realize like how long that would take. Yeah. One, because if you get a good tattoo artist, you're not getting in like a couple days in a row. Yeah. And thank God, because I would not want to go back the next day. It's brutal. It's like a it's, a, it's a legit trauma to put your body through. You don't realize it, but you sit down for a few hours um, getting tattooed and you leave and you just feel totally drained. It's like, I need a rest day after getting a tattoo. Yeah. I, my first part was just an outline. And I was like, man, this isn't as bad as everybody said. <laughs> so I was all gung ho for session two. And then that's when it got like into here. Oh yeah. And the coloring. And that's when I was like, oh yeah, now I get it. Yep. That it's, hurts a lot. 
it's like the uh, it's the baby skin that hurts so bad. Like the areas that don't get a lot of sun exposure that haven't been um, haven't been you know been conditioned for that sort of stuff always hurts the worst. It's like the areas that you could pinch and you really hate. That's why it sucks to get tattooed. Yeah, yeah. I've I've considered making it a full sleeve. Mm -hmm. uh, I just I want to make sure I have the right idea to finish it. Yeah, it's a slippery slope. I uh, I went years without getting a tattoo because I knew when I started I was gonna like want to finish whatever area I started on again. And that's kind of what happened with the leg is I got one piece and I was like, well, shit, I got to get this done now. Like, it's because anybody that's done like a sleeve or a half sleeve like you have knows that it's almost like you're embarrassed to show it until it's complete. Cause you're like, no, 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 you don't get it yet. You're like, you don't know what's going to be there. Yeah. Well, my co-hosts are telling me I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> Never too old for some ink. Never. Um, so I want to talk about Alex in and uh, Ricky real quick. Sure. They're, they're kind of coming at this from different perspectives. This is Alex's first ever games, mm -hmm. right? And, and we've talked to her a couple times on this show. And really, she, she didn't really believe in herself until Granite. Yeah. Right now, now she has a successful Granite. She's got a little belief. Now what? And by the way, her game shirt to raise money with the Ted Lasso believe is awesome. Yeah. I actually ordered one cause the shirt was just amazing. <laughs> and then, then you have Ricky who's coming back the big redemption story. Mm -hmm. And his first time at the games since he was suspended. Yeah. You've got two amazing stories happening at the same time. And you get to be a part of that. Like I just saying that I have goosebumps. It's cool. It's a unique experience. Obviously, you know, the Ricky piece is something that's incredibly unique to us right now, um, just because of the position that he's been in. Um, Ali, or sorry, Alex's position is something that I'm sure that a lot of coaches go through, you know, when they have a young athlete that breaks through for the first time, but to be a part of that is super special. And honestly, it's like the big reason that I was so excited to make the jump to move to Vegas this year is because there were so many things, so many great things happening in the camp that I didn't want to miss out on. And you don't get that same experience when you don't spend that time with them every day. So have you seen a difference in Alex since Granite Games? Yeah, huge. Uh, you know, just the confidence. I think through Granite Games and through training around that, she's had a lot of I don't know if I would necessarily call them first, but she's had a lot of moments where she just has been able to prove to herself or prove to other people um, that she's capable of more than she expected or that, you know, what she can do as it relates to the field is like better than she realized, you know, because I think there's a point in time where she knew she was really good at certain things, but she may have, she just kind of assumed that everybody was good at those things. She didn't know that, you know, how strong she is at legless rope climbs is like out of this world and that, was enough to to win an event and to to send to punch her ticket to the CrossFit Games. So, having those little moments, you know, um, knowing that you have the skill sets that it takes to excel at such a high level, is like no doubt a way to build a ton of confidence going to the games. Even if you know there's going to be some bumps in the road, and even if there's going to be some events that like she's not necessarily as prepared for right now, you know where something might be brand new to her she also has certain events that she can show up to and know that like she can have legit top 10 performances and that's that's exciting and really unique you could even see is that is that you Kiefer? is it your yeah. smoke alarm and full disclosure i did change the battery and so it's apparently not the battery and i just don't know how to operate this smoke alarm i just got into this apartment last week so cat i apologize <laughs> <laughs> So you could even see the confidence growing in Alex during that final event. Yeah. You know, like as she was, as she was extending her lead, like you could see it growing and growing and growing and that you guys almost had to say, okay, we, we know you got it now. Let's yeah. just, let's just not make any mistakes. Yeah. That was amazing. I think especially because, you know, she had a really good start to the weekend and I think it was maybe, three events in she was in the top five or right around there and then events four and five came and they were a struggle for her and so when she dropped back a little bit in the placing it's almost like she went from this place of like okay like 
maybe I do belong. Maybe, maybe I am good enough for this thing. And then two events took that away and we're like, never mind, this is just a fluke. And so to be able to come back, finish on such a high note with her best finish of the weekend on, you know, her most confident event and to be able to like run down the floor, punching her ticket was, I can't imagine how it felt for her and even knowing how amazing it felt for myself and for Justin and for her husband and her friends that were all on, on the start line there. Yeah. I, I was watching, you know, where I was standing the whole weekend, like right in front of her lane. It was like so epic to watch, but let's move to, well, here's a, a question for you. Who would you rather play one-on-one -on -one, Kemba Walker or Brianna Stewart? Uh, you know, I have actually, I've played one-on-one -on -one with Kemba and I can confidently say, I never want to do that again. So I would take, Brianna Stewart, knowing that she would also kick my ass, I'm certain. <laughs> it's just the lesser kicking. Yeah, right. Well, it's just different. Like Kemba's kicking would potentially leave me sitting on my butt on the court, whereas Brianna's would just be like, you know, just a better Twish. score, better player. Twish. Yeah, it's just Twish. different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just that sound. Like your smoke alarm, just twish, twish. Yep. Now, um, now I'm so conscious about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ricky, mm -hmm. there, there's a lot on the line for him at the, this games. Is he going in nervous or is it that Ricky that you see in the events he knows he's going to kill where he just kind of blacks out and goes to work? Uh, I think there's an element of both. Uh, you know, I don't think it's a secret at this point that like, you know, Ricky gets a little nervous going into competitions regardless, just because he's such a competitor and he wants to do so well. And I think to some degree, like, you know, when you know you're willing to go to such a dark place, it's almost a little bit more nerve wracking because you're afraid of how much something's going to hurt because you know you, you're capable of it. Right. And we saw a little bit of that at Torian. Um, you know, anybody that saw like the, the state that he was in after that first event, a lot of that had to do with the fact that he was like, anxious and sick and couldn't keep food down the day prior. And he was just a little depleted going into the day. Um, but yeah, I think, I think in the last four years, I really can only speak for the last year, I guess, especially, but Ricky has grown a ton uh, as an athlete, but also as a person, I think he's matured a lot. And I think as much as there is something on the line, I think he's also really made peace with where he's at and knows that he made a mistake and he's owned up to that. And, you know, he's, you know, done his podcast, he's had his conversations about it, and now he's ready to just come out and compete and, you know, maybe prove to himself that he that he belongs, um, but also just to perform and do the thing that he friggin' loves to do after not being able to do it for four years. So then I've watched you and Justin at all these events. You guys take turns at, like, who goes to the athlete area. Is, is there a role that each of you play or is it situational depending on what just happened? Uh, it's situational, maybe a little bit, um, you know, at, in at times it's dependent on who's going on the floor versus who's needing to warm up. Um, and at times a lot of it is like, is Justin so badly wants to, and needs to be out there on the floor seeing what's happening that, you know, I'm okay with being the one that's back in the warm up area, prepping somebody else. Um, you know, it just kind of fits our personalities a little better where like if he's in the warm up area while somebody else is competing, he's just going to pace around in circles and try to pull it up on YouTube and see what's going on. Whereas I can kind of take a step back a little bit, help prepare the person that we're working with in the athlete area where I know he's taking care of what's going out on the floor. Um, but yeah. We talked to Matt Torres a couple hours ago. Okay. And we asked him the question, are we going to get to a point where, because Matt Torres used to play college football, used to play college basketball, you have mm -hmm. your rivals. Are we going to get to a point in CrossFit where the camps become rivals? Uh, yeah, I'm sure. I think that that's just a natural progression in any sport. It's like, you know, you will find rivalries in athletes and eventually you'll find rivalries with training camps. I think that we already see that a little bit, maybe we have seen that a little bit with like the team side of CrossFit. And now that we have training camps for the individuals, I think it's only natural that we will see that in the same way. Um, you know, to this point, I think it's still small enough that at least from my understanding and conversations with Justin, like 
you know, a lot of the coaches have a ton of mutual respect for each other. Some of them are close friends, closer than others. Um, but you know, it only takes one or two seasons of somebody's athlete edging someone else out by one or two spots for, for things to get a little bit chippy. You look at like the Baltimore Ravens and the Pittsburgh Steelers say they have mutual respect for each other. Yeah. But when they're on the field, they want to kill. Oh yeah. Right. We want to kill everybody. I, I think the sport needs it. If people are indifferent to who wins, you, you don't have a professional sport. Yeah. You know what I mean? You have to have a team or a person to root for and other people that you don't like for there to be to a vested interest. Yeah, for sure. And I would love to see a, a time in the not too near future where the camp, like instead of the invitational, you have like an, like a camp invitational. It's mm. a great idea. Where Getting Mayhem invested. sends their best four, underdog sends their best four, proven sends their best four. Maybe that's the way that we blend back in some of the stuff that was happening with grid to what's going on with CrossFit. Yeah. I think it would be so fun to watch. And yeah. then people would start rooting for a camp or mm -hmm. a team. And then you got jersey sales, you've got all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think that's how a good start to blowing it up. It's a it's a really cool off season idea. I think that's kind of like part of what we see with Waterpalooza and the the same sex three person teams as opposed to the same format of teams that we see in the regular season. Is for the athletes, it's fun and different. For the spectators, it's still exciting because you get to see all the athletes that you want. But in a case that's maybe slightly lower stakes for them, I like the idea. I'm all for it. So we talked about you and Justin at the comps. What about you and Justin at training? Do you each have a role there? And is that situational? It's situational. Uh, you know, I think that there are maybe pieces that he's drawn to a little bit more and pieces of training that I'm drawn to a little bit more. But ultimately, it's kind of just, you know, between the two of us, a little bit of a triage approach of, you know, whether we have two people in the gym or six people in the gym, making sure that we're making our rounds and having touch points with everybody. You know, we'll often maybe pocket people off in groups of two or three based on what they're doing and if it's similar for the day. Uh, and then we'll just kind of pick our spots and work through, you know, Justin is very much like the mayor in a sense where like he wants to go around and I like, have touch points with everybody. And I sometimes get a little bit more sucked into like specific things that one or two people might be doing at a time. What does a day look like for an underdog athlete? I know you guys have like your midday Metcon. Yeah, we is have the rest uh, is oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so we have, you know, we work, we operate out of a gym called Camp Rhino and it's a massive space and we have a really good relationship with them. And we essentially have a time of the day allotted to us from around 1130 until three. And that's like a big open gym time for them, but predominantly dominated by our underdogs athletes. Um, we're fortunate enough that the majority of our athletes have a garage gym or access to some sort of equipment. And so what will happen is a lot of times people from the crew will do a session one at home and then they'll come in for like their second session or their primary session in the afternoon. And so that afternoon time is when we do a lot of our weightlifting, a lot of our more mixed Metcon type stuff. The morning might be more, you know, accessory conditioning based, sometimes with a skill piece mixed in. Uh, and so, you know, we have, parts that are much more solo parts that are much more group oriented and that like midday, you know, 1130 to three is the time that Justin and I are there with them. Cool. And so the, it's on the rest of it's their responsibility. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, still with our oversight, still with our communication on a daily basis. Um, but there, it is generally pieces that they can or are comfortable with or want to do alone. And then we just touch base with them on scores and how things are going and, you know, how their paces were and such. So just to finish up, when are you guys heading to Madison? Uh, Justin and I both fly into Chicago. We get into Chicago, I think, Saturday morning. Is that the 30th, maybe? Uh, and then we have to be in Madison Sunday for athlete briefings. So that's the plan. And is the whole team staying together? Uh, no, we're kind of grouped off. I can't speak for everybody specifically. Um, Justin and I are sharing a hotel room, which may turn out to be a terrible mistake because I don't. anybody who knows him knows he doesn't sleep at all during competition weeks. 
and he's a night owl to begin with. Uh, and then, you know, Jared is staying with a couple of our media people. Ricky is staying with his, I think his brother and his girlfriend. Alex is staying with her husband. So everybody's got like, you know, they're comfortable people that they're with and we'll all be close to each other and we'll spend a lot of time together, I'm sure. That's funny because right now, aren't the Cotlers staying with Alex? Yeah. yeah. So actually when you go travel, they're actually going to split up. Yeah, right. It's going to be tough for them. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we, uh, things popped up. What about recovery? Are the athletes on their own or do coaches guide them on recovery? Uh, yeah, the recovery is kind of like a collective piece, you know, both between Justin and I as coaches and the rest of the athletes, as well as, you know, some of them work with their own nutrition coaches. Um, a good chunk of them work with Mike Malloy from M2 performance. And, and there's a few others. I just don't know the names of the nutrition groups off the top of my head, but, uh, you know, over the last six months or so, we built out a little recovery station at the gym. And so we have a cold plunge, we have an infrared sauna. Um, most of the crew has their own, you know, Norma tech boots. And so recovery is something that is accessible and that they're able to use on a daily basis in a way that kind of like fits their schedule best. And I would be remiss not to say that Allison Scuds is our partner with Mobility Movement. Oh, yeah. You can go to mobilitymovement.com and use the code Clydesdale free month. Get a free month of mobility movement. There you go. Move more like Allie. Yeah. And and the Clydesdale. Of course. Yes. Before I worked with mobility movement, I could not get in a front rack. Oh, really? I can now get in a front rack where the bar sits on my on my chest. That's awesome. There you go. Yeah. So they are incredible. Well, Kiefer, this has been a blast. It's been good to get to know you this season. Um uh, through the stresses and the drama of semifinals. And now you get to see the payoff at the CrossFit Games. And I can't wait to see you in, in Madison. For sure. This has been awesome. I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah. We'll see you soon. All right. Have a good one, man.